Hunter-gatherers tend to not have as many children as one might expect. The forager women of the Kalahari Desert, for example, tend to give birth to around four or five children in their lifetime, without any use of either contraception or abstinence, and there are several factors going into this. First off, many forager women live lives that are just as active as the lives of female athletes, and female athletes in endurance sports often ovulate irregularly, if at all. Then there's the issue of nutrition, which is not even across the year. Hunter-gatherers lose weight during the lean season, and women stop ovulating when they lose too much body fat. And finally, there's the fact that breastfeeding a child can reduce ovulation, and the women of the Kalahari breastfeed their children until they are anywhere from three to six years old. All of this applies to my imaginary foragers as well, so their small families look like they might have been planned when they definitely weren't. All the factors I've mentioned result in the kids being spaced out by a few years, so even though there's only a few of them, women spend their reproductive years always looking after the new young child, and this ends up having broader effects. Hunter-gatherer societies tend to be simplified as ones where women only ever gather, while men only ever hunt. But Mikaya men in Madagascar gather plant food together with the women during the dry season, while the men of the Kalahari Desert gather food when returning home from an unsuccessful hunt. And it's fairly common for forager women to hunt small game, and even in those societies where women never intentionally set out on a hunt, if they encounter game while out gathering, they don't just ignore it. In Marjorie Shostak's account of the Johansi, the woman she interviewed talked about how once, when she was a little girl, and was together with her mother who was out gathering, she noticed a baby Steinbuck. She went off chasing after it, and then caught it and killed it by banging its head into the ground. But still, among the existing forager societies, women almost never set out to hunt large game. One explanation for this is that hunting large game is incompatible with pregnancy, breastfeeding, and childcare. The children often breastfeed until they are several years old, and women are often accompanied by children in their foraging trips. The little Johansi girl I'd mentioned was tagging along with her mother when she noticed that baby Steinbuck. And the child can get tired, complain, or ask to return back to camp, which could get pretty annoying when tracking an animal for several days, and it's the reason why men prefer to not have any children with them when they are out hunting. And while gathering can be a straining activity on the person digging tubers with a stick and then carrying food back to camp, it does not strain the kid who's just tagging along. And gathering is an activity that can be interrupted at no cost in order to tend to a child's needs. And the two can return to camp any time, because the berries and tubers will not run away anywhere. And my imaginary forager women do both gather and hunt, but their hunting trips tend to be shorter than men's, and they go after easier game, because then they can quickly return to camp and tend to their children. Among the Aeta of the Philippines, the women come back home with a kill 31% of the time, while the men average 17%. It's the result of men targeting prey that is larger and harder to acquire, which also results in men procuring two times more meat than women do, despite the lower hunting success rate. And arriving in camp with lots of meat means sharing that meat with others, which means making others indebted to the hunter. And fatty meat from large game is the food that hunter-gatherers value the most, so being a good hunter who frequently comes back to camp with lots of meat and shares it with others results in good hunters accruing prestige in their community, while the plant food and the small game that women bring tends to stay within the family, and they end up not having an avenue for gaining prestige. So even the most egalitarian of hunter-gatherer societies are never quite entirely egalitarian. And women don't start hunting large game once they are past their reproductive age, because it takes many years to get good at it. 
Men's hunting abilities tend to peak when they are in their forties, and women also become better at gathering as years go by, so it would not make sense for them to abandon something they are really good at in order to take up large game hunting instead, even though coming back to camp with some tubers does not accrue any prestige to anyone, when plant food is a big part of the diet, an experienced gatherer is important to a community. All that said, my foragers are about as egalitarian as a group of people can get, and even though everybody knows who is the most respected person in the group, if it all starts getting too much into his head, everyone else can just make fun of him in order to put him in his proper place, or pack up and leave him. But my imaginary foragers have a very clearly hierarchical society in the river basin to the west of them, and my foragers are and have always been in contact with people from that society. So join me in the next video, where I will talk about what these two neighbors think of one another.